it's a joy to be with you. Uh, we have a lesson this evening that I think is one of the more valuable lessons, at least it's current. It's, it's the big thing nowadays, it seems to be talking about state sovereignty. I mean, what's Arizona doing down there? I mean, they ought to be sued and put in their place as an administrative agency. How dare them stand up and take care of the problem on the borders? State sovereignty, the original concept. And we're going to go back in history and try and sort that out. Last, last week, our format was to go for about 50 minutes and then take a break, and then we'll come in with our, hopefully, a powerful closing statement. So we'll try to do that. Somebody has to kind of clue me. Who's going to be my clue for time? Marla, do you have a watch? No watch? Okay, are you able to jump up and down? You probably have to shoot a flare up if I can barely see you. So if you run up on the stage and wave one of these red vests, I'm not quite that dramatic. <laughs> then we'll know to take a break. We'll probably come to the slide that says take a break. You may not have to do that at all. Okay, state sovereignty, the original concept. Newsflash, March the 30th, 2009. Taking on the feds. Now this is news a year ago. Notice it's only that long ago that one of the states took a firm stand on state sovereignty. And that state was Oklahoma. Here we have Representative, Representative Charles Key, and he's attempting to uh, explain the latest movement on state sovereignty. All of us have taken an oath to uphold the Constitution. And the Constitution either means what it says, or it means nothing. State Sovereignty Movement, or Tenth Amendment Movement, are names given to this movement, and I think we can say it started in modern times in Oklahoma. Although when I was in Montana a couple of weeks ago, they had some state sovereignty resolutions they passed 10 years ago, but they never went anywhere. No one paid any attention to the resolutions. So here we see across the country now, things are changing. This is a quotation from the, the bill or the resolution that they passed. This serves as notice and demand to the federal government as our agent to cease and desist effective immediately mandates that are beyond the scope of the constitutionally delegated powers. Now that's saying it pretty clear. Federal government, you have a job to do. Don't do anything more than what we have empowered you to do. Stay within your constitutionally delegated powers. Here's the state, uh, the state of Oklahoma in the Senate. This is Randy Brogdon, and he's here surrounded by He's surrounded by people just like you. Just good, common, decent people that supported the state sovereignty movement. And when I look at that, I look at the audience and they just, just look the same. You notice there's old people and young people and, and just all kinds of people that support the state sovereignty movement and Randy Brogan. Quoting again from their resolution that passed in both the House and the Senate, the state of Oklahoma hereby claims sovereignty under the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. It passed in the House 83 to 13, and in the Senate 25 to 17. So it passed by a big margin in Oklahoma. I believe this is a, can you read the flowers on the front? What state is this? Montana. But they passed resolutions in Montana starting in 1995. The Montana Mandates Act to reject federal unfunded mandates. The governor, it passed, but the governor refused to enforce the law. Then in 1995, they also passed the Sovereignty Resolution to reclaim 10th Amendment rights. No action was taken until 2009. So we say that Montana passed some good movements, but they didn't do anything about it. In 2009, the Montana Firearms Freedom Act asserting state sovereignty was passed, and they are doing something about that. Utah and other states followed the same pattern, and in this last legislative session in Utah, we passed similar legislation asserting state sovereignty with regard to manufacturing, in specific case, firearms. In 2010, they passed, oh no, they only debated, but it was a hot debate, lively debate, was the statement made by the representative I interviewed. He said, we had a lively debate, but it did not pass, and that was to assert states' rights with a Tenth Amendment statement. Now, there are other states that are doing things, trying to stir up the concept of states' rights. This one is the news release on the Montana uh, gun law asserting states' rights. Here's actually what it says. The Montana Firearms Freedom Act states that a personal firearm, a firearm accessory, or ammunition that is manufactured commercially or privately in Montana, and that remains within the borders of Montana, 
is not subject to federal law or federal regulation. Now, this is not about firearms. This is about asserting sovereignty. But this is an issue that the federal government will not pass or ignore. And so they immediately sent the state of Montana an announcement that they are supreme. The federal government will tell them what they can manufacture in regard to firearms. So this will go to the courts. It will definitely be a pivotal case. The same thing will be happening in Utah. That's why the state legislature set aside funding for legal action. So this is spreading. The blue areas up there are states that have either passed or, oh, it says passed on the clue down there at the bottom of the key. The red areas where they're not doing anything and the blue areas where they have passed firearms resolutions. Deseret News, June 29, 2009. Now, this is a year ago, and we want to pay attention to what happened in that year. State sovereignty. One thing not reported by the media about the recent Republican state convention was the passing of Resolution 3. We voted for the Republican Party to take any and all steps necessary to ensure that federal powers exercised within the great state of Utah not exceed those granted by the Constitution of the United States, thus protecting Utah state sovereignty. Now, I interviewed Sherry Ramirez and discussed this with her, and that was simply something that they passed as a political party. But something happened. In the state of Utah, we began to assert sovereignty. Now, up in the corner is my friend Bill Wright. We would not be here this evening if Bill Wright had not initiated this. Is that right, David Jensen? Yes. Yes, it's Bill Wright that took David Jensen, our chairman, down to my house, and we discussed what to do in this community, and we're here because of that. Utah state asserts sovereignty. Here are the 12 bills and resolutions that passed in the state legislature this past season asserting sovereignty, some to more extent than others. The Utah State Made Firearms Protection Act, similar to the one in Montana. Joint resolution, state sovereignty on the 10th Amendment. State sovereignty concurrent resolution. Political party bylaws. Health system amendments. Concurrent resolution on states' rights. Public lands litigation. Eminent domain authority. And Bill Wright explained to me that that was really important because we had given to the state, or how do we say that? It's a touchy subject for me. When Utah became a state, certain lands were given to the state as trust lands, and they were surrounded by federal land, and the trust lands are inaccessible. And so if we want to benefit by the trust lands, which were supposed to help our school system, we need access to them. And so in this last legislative session, they said we have eminent domain on federal land. Now that will be interesting to see what happens. Resolutions opposing the use of presidential national monuments. You can remember what the, the staircase Escalante National Monument issue and how they, they took away the land through a presidential signing statement. Law enforcement by federal land management agencies and historic growth. Isn't this exciting? This is what we did in our state of Utah in one season. <laughs> yes, it is worth it applause. So do you know your legislator? Now that's my legislator. I work with him. He's my, my friend and associate, and I can talk with him and discuss current events, and he's open enough to do that. Do you know your legislator? And are you able to discuss the issues with him and find out where we are and where we're going? The New York Times, March 16, 2010. Headline, states' rights is rallying cry for lawmakers. Who is the sovereign? The state or the federal government? Said State Representative Chris N. Herod, a Republican from Provo, Utah. I love it. Provo, Utah, a state representative being quoted in the New York Times. He goes on. There's a tsunami of interest in states' rights and resistance to an overbearing federal government. Isn't that great that that's headline news in New York City? March the 7th, 2010, this is the front cover of The New American. It has become my favorite news magazine. The New American does an excellent job. Notice they have a pair of boxing gloves. And, and down below, state versus federal. As we watch the two contending forces, is there really such a thing as state sovereignty? And if there is, how do we get it back again? 
Yahoo Mail, November the 7th, 2009. Headline, State Sovereignty Resolutions and Nullification Acts. The Tenth Amendment Center, an organization seeking to promote the original concept of state sovereignty. Da -da 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 -da. That's where we're going to stop right now because what we want to talk about tonight, the original concept of state sovereignty. Who on the street, if you went out into the streets of your nearest community, who could you stop and ask, could you give me an, ex an explanation of the original concept of state sovereignty? What would they say? The, this is a subject that's virtually unknown. We, we throw the word out, the general public hears it, and we hear strange statements we'll cover tonight in some detail about, well, the federal government shares dual sovereignty with the states. It's just that they're more sovereign than we are. <laughs> Things like that. In the book, The 5,000-Year Leap, principle number 10 reads, the God-given right to govern is vested in the sovereign authority of the whole people. Now, I was there when the book was created. I had the joy of working with the grand old man that wrote the book, and he gave me assignments from time to time, and the very first one was on the first principle. He said, go and find out everything there is to know about the laws of nature and of nature's God. Spoken of by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence. That was my first assignment on this book, and I rejoice to have been there and participated in its creation. In March of last year, it reached number one national bestseller. If we would follow, thank you. If we would follow the principles in the 5,000 year leap, there are 28, they're called the 28 Principles of Liberty. And we say it's Constitutional Principles 101. These are the fundamental principles upon which a free nation is founded. If we would follow those principles, the sun would rise on America again. That's why we changed the front cover to sunrise. Old books, lots of books. Reading is the best way for me to learn. I think others can learn from watching and listening. I need to read. And so reading old books often brings light on subjects that I had never heard before. I enjoyed reading this old book, Walter Neal, The Sovereignty of the States, written in 1910. Quote from the book, In wresting the power, or what is called the sovereignty from the crown, it passed directly to the people. It passed directly to the people of each colony, and not to the people of all the colonies in the aggregate, to 13 distinct communities, and not to one. Now I spent the four hours today trying to explain to that piece of glass, that teleprompter, that there were 13 distinct nations created. Those nations were being called states years before they became, years before they declared their independence. And there were 13 free, sovereign, independent states that eventually declared independence, became nations, and wrested the power from the sovereign or the crown. And it passed directly to who? The people. See the people right up there in that first one. The sovereignty went to the people. It passed directly to the people of each colony and not to the people of all the colonies in the aggregate. This is extremely important to understand because the other viewpoint is that the great aggregate whole of the people created the plan of government, and the states are simply administrative agencies created by the Constitution. That's the popular viewpoint. And they teach it in political science classes all across the country. They say the Constitution, in the blink of a legal eye, created the states. That's a direct quote from a political science professor at Iowa State University. He said, the, and, and, well, that's enough on that, we go on to 13 distinct communities and not to one. So it wasn't a great nation born on the 4th of July. There were 13 nations came forth, and those 13 nations had a specific identity that had been created many, many years before as they, independent of each other, came from colonial status, colonies up to states, and nation status. 13 nations. That's different than what you'll usually hear. Talk radio. I was on talk radio a few weeks ago, and one of the callers said, 50 years ago, the government started to subvert the Constitution. 
Well, I was in a meeting not long ago, like three weeks ago, over here at the, Abraham, the, the Lincoln Academy in Pleasant Grove, and the speaker stood up and he said, 70 years ago, the federal government began to pervert the Constitution. Now, I, won't, I won't mention who that was that said that, but he's now running for the United States Senate. When did the federal government begin to pervert and subvert the Constitution? I used to be a math teacher, and I said, if you take the year 1789 and subtract it from the year 2010, that will tell you when they started to subvert the Constitution. And you'll see some examples of that this evening. From the very beginning, they quit following it, not completely, but in part. Oh, so I struck out 50 years ago, and since then I have this 70 year ago example. Afterwards, I asked the speaker what he had in mind, and he named a Supreme Court case 70 years ago in which this federal government started violating the Interstate Commerce Clause. Well, my goodness, we can go back any, any period of time, we can go back almost every year and find a case where some significant violations took place. So it's not 50 years ago, it's not 70 years ago. In fact, sometimes people say to me, oh, it was Franklin Roosevelt during that terrible New Deal. That's when the Constitution was perverted. Well, others will say, oh, no, no. It was in the days of Woodrow Wilson. It was the 13th, uh, it was the 16th Amendment, the 17th Amendment, and the Federal Reserve Act. Those were the violations that were the pivotal point in history when they started violating the Constitution. And others will say, oh, no, no, no. I say, just a minute. If we go back to Adam and Eve, when Eve partook of the forbidden fruit, okay, we have these two contending forces that have always been with us. And it will always be that way on this earth as we contend with good and evil. We have a duty to perform, to conquer the enemies of righteousness. And those enemies have been with our government ever since its inception. Albert Taylor Bledsoe in 1907 he had lived through the war we call the Civil War, and in his preface to his book, this is his book, is Davis the Traitor, in the preface, he explains that he wants to tell the story so that his grandchildren and his children can know what happened. I read this book with great interest. Now it's out on the table, we have a few copies, but there is a spelling error on the front cover of the new one, it doesn't look like this. It says, is Davis a, a, a traitor? Two A's. It's still the same book inside. But this is, it's a photographic reprint, so the typing errors are all from the old days. It's an excellent read, an excellent read. Secession as a constitutional right prior to the War of 1861. Now we're gonna let Albert Taylor Bledsoe give us a few words of counsel as we progress through the evening, and so we're gonna let him say what's happening in his opinion. Albert Taylor Bledsoe. Ever since the Declaration of Independence, there have been two great political parties in the United States. Now it's these two contending forces. Now these are the two contending forces. These are summaries that I have created from my study. One of the forces was that they believed the states are districts of people composing one political society. The American people form one consolidated nation. Now you see the great aggregate whole of the people created the the Constitution, and the Constitution created the states. Now that's this viewpoint over here. The other viewpoint is the states were free, sovereign, independent, and maintained this status even after creating and ratifying the Constitution. Now both forces can't be true because they completely contradict each other. So either one or the other is false, and they may both be false, but neither, both of them are not true. Let's summarize it and boil it down to simpler words. Sovereignty of the national government versus sovereignty of the individual states. Which was the original intent and position taken by our founding fathers? In the American Dictionary of the English Language of 1828, now when we study old history, we need to know what the words meant when they were created, when they were using them. So we need to go back in the dictionaries of the time period. For example, in last week's lesson, we talked about the words as they were used in 1774, specifically the words Congress. And we found the word Congress evolved. 
in 1774. It had a different meaning than it had in 1828 and a completely, totally different meaning in 1864. And so we're going to look back at the word sovereign as it was used in the time period of our founding fathers. Supreme in power, the possession of the highest power. Sovereignty is superlative. It's the highest power. In the book, The Republic of Republics, by Bernard Janin Sage, written in 1878, I believe we still have some on the table, excellent reading, helps to grasp this time period. In fact, Bernard Janin Sage was attempting to write a 100th anniversary book, 1776 to 1876, but he said the reconstruction period was so difficult that he decided not to publish for a couple of years, and that's why it came out in 1878. He writes, the people are the fountain of all power. They must, however, delegate it to agents because they cannot exercise it in person. Another great book from the time period. This was written in 1823. New Views of the Constitution of the United States by John Taylor of Caroline. And they always say John Taylor of Caroline because apparently his name was so common they had to just describe where he comes from. The Constitution was thus a compact among the states, resting on the sovereignty of the people as expressed through their state conventions. See, I have friends today that say, say, there's no such thing as state sovereignty. All the sovereignty is in the people. Well, that's right, but you better get a handle on how to use the phrase state sovereignty if there's a movement going across the country now. It must mean something. What is the definition of state sovereignty? Well, he gave the definition clear back in 1823 as expressed through their state conventions. And so we have the states expressing the sovereignty of the people. Our government system is established by compact, not between the government of the United States and the state governments, but between the states as sovereign communities. A sovereign community is the word we're trying to understand tonight. In 1861, on July the 4th, President Abraham Lincoln's message on, well, his State of the Union, whatever the condition was, was a trying time. He gave a message to Congress. In that message, he defined sovereignty. Here's the definition from that message. A political community without a superior. Okay, then that means it's a political community that is at the highest level of its power. It has no other community above it that can tell it what to do. A political community without a superior. When we compare the definition of Abraham Lincoln with the definition of Noah Webster, supreme in power, the possession of the highest power. Well, a, a political community without a superior is supreme in power. It is in possession of the highest power. These definitions harmonized. However, President Lincoln went on to explain, no one of our states except Texas ever was a sovereignty. And even Texas gave up the character on coming into the Union. The Union is older than any of the states, and in fact, it created them as states. Now, there are two contending forces. This is the expression of one of those forces. Remember, one of the forces believes sovereignty of the national government, and the other force believes in sovereignty of the individual states. Webster's New World Dictionary, College Edition, 1957. Now, why do you suppose I picked the 1957 edition? It's because I graduated from high school and went to college in 1957. And there they made us buy a big stack of books. Every quarter we had to buy more books. Now all those years have gone by, and the only book worth keeping was the dictionary. <laughs> Sovereign above or superior to all others, chief, greatest, supreme, independent of all others as a sovereign state. Now notice I picked definitions one and four. The Oxford English Dictionary is the dictionary that gives you the word history. And, and I don't know, it's like 16 volumes. I don't own it, I always call my friend that owns the condensed version and you have to read it with a magnifying glass, literally. They sell the dictionaries, it's two thick volumes with a magnifying glass. Well, my, my friend reported back there were six pages 
defining the word state as it has been historically used. And definition 30C is the definition used by Thomas Jefferson in his 1774 publication on states' rights. Now, isn't that interesting? 30C. So we have to pick the definition as it applies to our application of the word. Above, superior to all other, chief, greatest, supreme. So it's still a superlative. Independent of all others as a sovereign state. That means the state, when it is sovereign, is independent of all other states. No other state can tell it what to do. There is no federal government of any kind that can tell that state what to do. Because a sovereign state is the highest, the greatest, the supreme. That was the one position 200 plus years ago. Now these two books are valuable. They go hand in hand. That's why I brought a half a case of each. And they're out on the table tonight. Most people have never heard of the book on the right. The book on the left is very popular. The Federalist Papers written by Federalists. Now if you want to know the Federalist viewpoint, you, you could probably get it from a Federalist, but don't we want to know the other viewpoints that were in circulation? Would that be helpful? Do you think there were any good people besides the Federalist? Were there any other viewpoints worth considering? Can you name one of the anti-Federalists? Just name one. Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry. Thank you. Front row. Front row always gets a star. Okay? Patrick Henry was one. That's probably Patrick Henry up there on the screen. This probably represents Patrick Henry in the artist's conception here. The Anti-Federalist and Federalist Papers. We'll say something about both of them. One of the most famous, probably the most famous nationalist is this man right here. One of the authors of the Federalist Papers. He wrote about two-thirds of them. This is James Madison. And this is John Jay. John Jay was ill at the time, and he didn't make much of a contribution. So most of the work in this book explaining the Constitution from the Federalist perspective is from James Madison and Alexander Hamilton. Now, people will, will give me books about books. Have you ever had somebody give you a book about the Bible? So, somebody writes a book about the Bible or some chapter in the Bible. The book, uh, what does Isaiah mean? Now, there's several books on that. What does Isaiah mean? You know, we ought to really read Isaiah before we worry about what some other American thinks Isaiah means. I suggest you try that on these founding fathers. Read their speeches, read their works, not just a little quotation or an excerpt. For example, this book right here, The Basic Ideas of Alexander Hamilton. Scholar Richard Morris was kind enough in 1956 to gather complete essays, complete speeches, uh, so that the ideas were not out of context, so that you could see what he said on a subject. I enjoyed reading the 440 pages in this book to help understand Alexander Hamilton. For example, on pages 125 to 127, Alexander Hamilton explains his plan for good government. He says at the Constitutional Convention, he says good government would include centralized power in the national government with full sovereignty. Okay, there would be no state sovereignty. All the power would be focused in the national government. The chief executive and senators to serve during good behavior. How long is good behavior? That's a long time. It could be. That means he wants the chief executive and the senators to serve basically for life. The chief executive to have absolute veto power. Really now? You mean the legislative body could pass a law and the chief executive could over, override it or veto any law? That's what he wanted. The central government would appoint state governors with absolute veto power over the laws passed by the respective state legislatures. Do you understand the kind of government he had in mind? Well, the founding fathers that were listening to Alexander Hamilton basically said, thank you, Alexander. Next. And he and the two delegates from New York went home. And he, later he came back. But the other two delegates never did. His plan was not the mainstream thinking of these men that were trying to create a program of liberty. On page 130, James Madison is quoted. Now James Madison is the scholar that was writing the notes of the Federal Convention. He took meticulous notes. His notes today are considered to be the most useful in understanding the Constitution. 
His explanations are very valuable. He wrote, Mr. Hamilton disliked the proposed scheme of government, but meant to support the plan as better than nothing. Really? <laughs> well, it's better than nothing. How would you feel? You know, your wife, you, you know, you have a discussion. Oh, well, go ahead, it's better than nothing. <laughs> anyway, the, the Hamilton viewpoint kind of made me smile. September the 17th, 1787. This is the day we uh, give credit to for when the persons who attended this convention finally got around to agreeing and signing. Not all of them signed, but many of them did. Now, this is my note. Sentiment in the country was hostile to a national government and preferred a confederation or federation. The words were then synonymous. By a clever move, the proponents of the proposed constitution called themselves federalists. They wanted a federal government. They wanted a government with more power than the Articles of Confederation. And so they called themselves Federalist. The Federalist Papers was the result of three Federalists trying to convince the anti-Federalists in the state of New York that the Constitution would be a good plan. And they went to great effort. They wrote the essays as a series of newspaper articles. They did not sign their name. And so it was a long time later before we had any idea who wrote the articles. So in the newspaper, you could read what the proposed plan of government was going to do for America. Remember, the signing took place in 1787, and it wasn't until 1789 that the government started acting upon the Constitution, and then not all the states joined. Special pleadings for the Constitution before ratification. This is what the Federalist Paper is. Supposed neutrality in explaining the meaning of the Constitution. And just a story, that's a the famous chief justice, uh, not chief, the famous justice of the court later would write his book Commentaries on the Constitution, and it was based on the Federalist Papers. They used the signing name Publius, and no one knew who that was. On page 133 of the Basic Ideas of Alexander Hamilton, a letter from Thomas Jefferson is included. Jefferson's letter from Paris he praised, now by the way, Jefferson lived in Paris because he was the uh, ambassador to France. And you know the most, I think it's the most incorrect answer I get most often is, I'll ask an audience, who wrote the Constitution? And who do you think they usually throw their hand, especially the high school students, up, throw their hand up, yes, Thomas Jefferson. I don't know where the idea is being taught, but Jefferson didn't even live in America when the Constitution was being written. He was in France. But somebody was sending him the newspaper articles. And so every once in a while on the slow boat to France, he would get a package of newspapers and he would read them and he wrote back this response. November of 1788, he praised the Federalist as the best commentary on the principles of government which ever was written. Now that was a... a that's an important statement coming from Thomas Jefferson. In some parts it is discoverable that the author means only to say what may be best said in defense of opinion in opinions in which he did not concur. Yes, Jefferson was scholar enough, he could just see through the lines and he could recognize that whoever was writing those essays didn't believe what he was saying. Isn't that amazing? Who could he be talking about but Alexander Hamilton? This divides the Federalist up into the three segments. Hamilton wrote about two-thirds, uh, Madison about one-third, and Jay a small portion. The Federalist papers were written by Federalists to convince the anti-Federalists in the state of New York that it would be safe to ratify the proposed Constitution. Hamilton certainly did not like the plan, but thought it would be better than nothing the delegates elected to the New York Ratifying Convention were largely anti-Federalist. There were 46 anti-Federalist and 19 Federalist. And somehow, Alexander Hamilton needed to convince the anti-Federalist that the plan would work, that it would be a good plan. Now, the anti-Federalist, the anti-Federalist, I'm quoting uh, and, and paraphrasing from some of the papers in the book that has been collected for them. They were the foes of ratification. 
The foes of ratification were left with the negative designation anti-federalist. I've mentioned that word occasionally to some people and that aren't in the know, and they'll say, well, anti-federalist, they must have been the bad guys. You know, the anti, you know. No. No, they were just a different group of people. They were good people that had a different opinion, and their opinion was just as valuable as anyone else's. Here's a quotation from that uh, publication. They sought a society where virtuous, hardworking, honest men and women, excuse me, I correct myself, I don't have my page number down, so this would be me paraphrasing an article from the publication. They sought a society where virtuous, hardworking, honest men and women lived simply in their own communities, enjoyed their families and their neighbors, were devoted to the common welfare, and had such churches, schools, trade associations, and local governments as they needed to sustain their values and purposes. Now that isn't all bad, is it? Isn't that what we try to do in Lehigh and Pleasant Grove and Provo and Saratoga Springs? Isn't that the nature of what we, a life we would like to live? The end of good government is the protection of life, liberty, and property. Any other function is usurpation and oppression. This is a summary of the belief of the anti-federalist. Their greatest fear, the proposed constitution would be construed to create a great, splendid, consolidated government and universal empire. That's exactly what happened. Their greatest fear was realized less than a hundred years later. Patrick Henry, the artwork here represents Patrick Henry in one of these famous orations. By the way, this is in Abel Parker Upshur's book I'm quoting from. Those nations who have gone in search of grandeur, power, and splendor have also fallen a sacrifice and been the victims of their own folly. While they acquired those visionary blessings, they lost their freedom. The first thing I have at heart is American liberty. Maintain free, sovereign, independent states. Give me liberty or give me death. And this is the, the great Patrick Henry, probably one of the greatest statesmen that ever lived in this country. In contrast to that, we have Alexander Hamilton's teachings. The people seldom judge or determine right. Give therefore to the first class a distinct permanent share of the government. Hence he wanted the aristocracy to run the country, the senators and the president would be appointed during good behavior, which is basically for life. Let the aristocracy run, the people are too stupid to rule. This would be called the viewpoint of the consolidationist. Now they called themselves that, that's not a modern political science term. They were calling themselves consolidationists clear back in that time, or nationalists. They wanted a powerful central government. One nation, indivisible, was what they were looking for. The, the doctrine of the nationalist can be summarized in these phrases. Enumerated powers plus implied powers. The Bank of the United States, blessing of a national debt, Non-uniform excise taxes, a standing army, protective tariffs. A protective tariff differs from a revenue tariff in that a protective tariff is so high that foreign countries won't bother to send anything over. And all of the, country, the manufacturing industries here would then have the upper edge and the advantage if it set their, their prices high, no competition from foreigners. Well, isn't that good? Don't we want to buy American and stay American? Well, if we think about this and look at the economic value, there's a value in having a revenue tariff, not a protective tariff. In fact, it was the protective tariff that caused the state of South Carolina to become alarmed and in 1828 said, we'll either nullify that protective tariff or we'll secede from the Union. Remember that bit of our history? And then the hot-headed President Andrew Jackson said he would invade and force them to follow the rule and so on. A growing power of the President and growing power of the judiciary. Now these were all goals of Alexander Hamilton that I discovered when I read that book, The Ideas of Alexander Hamilton, and that's where they're taken from. State sovereignty. 
alexander hamilton this is a quotation from the book on the screen alexander hamilton begat the federal party the federal party begat the whig party the whig party begat the republican party now that's the republican party of today this is its genealogy wendell phillips he was a very prominent republican senator during the period we call the civil war wendell phillips declared the Republican Party is in no sense a national party. It is a party of the North organized against the South. Well, this is a little different than the Republican Party you belong to today, but this is the genealogy of where it originated. Hamilton's sole object was to create a government outside the federal constitution. And today, 1910, that is the chief object of the Republican Party. Alexander Hamilton. As I study and try to understand periods of time, I try to summarize. And I summarized Hamilton in a few words here. And I would say, if I were to write an epitaph and put it on Hamilton's gravestone, these are the words I would put on. Father of constitutional subversion and the most famous nationalist in American history. <laughs> now, this causes some of my friends great consternation. They, oh, you must not say that, uh, say that about one of our great founding fathers. Well, there were two contending forces, and he was on the side that I don't agree with. In fact, he and Thomas Jefferson, later in history, would find their, their names being used to represent those two contending forces, and books and scholars and authors would write, that would be Hamiltonian thinking, or that would be Jeffersonian thinking. And they were always in conflict, like cutting heads. The sovereignty of the states, quote, this new government was to be made out of the doctrine of implied powers. Now that's the new government the Republican Party was promoting in the year 1910, re referring back to the quotation we just made. This new government was to be made out of the doctrine of implied powers. Under the constructive decisions of the Supreme Court, no restrictions limit the kind of government that may be established under the doctrine of implied powers. John Marshall was the judicial exponent of Alexander Hamilton. There's an excellent readout on the table, and it's a, it's a little thin publication by John McManus. What's the name of it? Restoring the Rights of the States? Something like that. It's just a little publication, about 50 pages. And you'll notice that the author, John McManus, starts with John Marshall. And I wrote him a letter and said, why didn't you start with the root of the problem and start with Alexander Hamilton? And he wrote back and said, the audience isn't ready to accept that. In other words, pre-assessment of the audience to him said, don't start with Hamilton, start with something they might accept. And so he started with John Marshall. John Marshall was the judicial exponent of Alexander Hamilton. He was a consolidationist and a nationalist that wanted no state sovereignty. The federal government would have all sovereignty and would be called a national government. John Marshall, Chief Justice for a long time, consolidationist and Hamiltonian nationalist. In the case of Marbury versus Madison, now when we talk about 50 years ago the Constitution was violated, or 70 years ago, when we talk about that, we just as well say, well, subtract 1803 from 2010 and the Constitution was violated then. What did he do? Well, he invented, but he didn't originate the idea. He simply carried on the idea that Alexander Hamilton invented the doctrine of implied powers. It is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. And they called that judicial review. It later was known as judicial supremacy, and today we call it supremacist judges. And we will show you on the federal government website where they declare the Supreme Court is the final say in what the Constitution means. And the only way to change a Supreme Court decision is if they change it themselves. Is that really the way it was intended? No. This is the quotation. Welcome. Choose a grade range. Go to the Federal Government website and you can read. The Supreme Court stands as the ultimate authority in constitutional interpretation. Its decisions can be changed only by another Supreme Court decision or by a constitutional amendment. Is that the only way to change a Supreme Court decision? No, absolutely not. That's false propaganda. And there's a lot of it circulating today. 
This, when it's in a bubble like that, that means I have paraphrased thinking. I didn't find one little succinct statement I could get on the screen, so I paraphrased thinking. You can read this, the stories in a number of different sources. Here I'm reading and quoting from a book called Hamilton's Curse, published about a year ago, page 64. The citizens of the states were never sovereign, and therefore they must always yield to the supremacy of the federal government. Now that's just the same thing that uh, about 60 years later Abraham Lincoln would say. Remember the quotation from President Lincoln when his uh, message was read before Congress, July the 4th, 1861? And he said, the states were never sovereign except Texas, and it gave up its sovereignty. Remember that statement? This is the same thing. And, and they're, they're from the same school of thought, the consolidationist school. Some of the worst justices ever were appointed by Republican presidents. I insert that slide because every now and then somebody will say, oh, if John McCain had just been selected president, we would have had conservative justices. <laughs> Things like that. And, and it's not true. The history bears out that some of the worst justices are appointed by people that are Republican presidents. Hamiltonian and Jeffersonian thinking are completely at odds with each other. They're completely contradictory. And so we depict them here, butting heads. <laughs> View of the Constitution of the United States by St. George Tucker is an enjoyable read. In 1803, this fine scholar and lawyer writes this law textbook explaining the Constitution. He declares, it is the external restraint and not the moderation of rulers that constitutes a state of liberty. So if we had Alexander Hamilton's rulers who were the aristocracy appointed for life or during good behavior, what restraint would there be on them? This is what St. George Tucker is trying to explain. It's the external restraint. It's this limitation of power that we place upon our elected leaders. It's the external restraint and not the moderation of rulers that constitutes a state of liberty. The Constitution is to be understood as explained by the ratifiers of the several states. Now this concept was slow in developing in my mind. The ratifiers, as they understood it, were the ones that gave the Constitution life. It had no life when it was signed by the men that wrote it. They didn't give it any life at all. They were just delegated the responsibility of drafting the plan. They were supposed to modify the Articles of Confederation. They got a little carried away, came up with a whole new program, but they didn't give it any life. They sent it to Congress. The Congress were the delegates from 13, actually, I'm thinking if there were 13 presidents. I don't know about that Congress. The Second Continental Congress, the First Continental Congress, how many delegates came? I don't know what it was like when they sent the Constitution. I don't know how many came. But in any event, those delegates that came to Congress were delegates from the sovereign nations. Using the word Congress as it was defined in that time period, they were delegates from sovereign nations coming together to discuss a common problem. And when they got the Constitution and they signed it, all that said was they approved. It gave it no life. Where did the Constitution get life? It was from the ratifiers. And so it's what they believed that it meant. It's what they believed that the Constitution means today. And it's not good enough to study the Federalist Papers or study the notes of the Federal Convention if there is a conflict in that and what the ratifiers believed it meant. You better go with what the ratifiers believed because they are the ones that gave life. The Constitution is to be understood as explained by the ratifiers of the several states. Example, at the ratifying convention in the state of New York. Now, after Alexander Hamilton, or as he was writing and promoting the Federalist Papers, they eventually got their delegation together, the anti-Federalist delegates and the Federalist delegates, and Hamilton had this duty to perform. He had to convince the anti-Federalist that this proposed plan of government would be good. He said, the United States Congress would never contemplate marching the troops of one state into the bosom of another for any reason. Now think about that one. Is there any case in the history of the United States where the government marched troops into a state? I can think of several places. 
the earliest one was george washington and the whiskey rebellion where he marched thirteen thousand troops unconstitutionally into pennsylvania in any event he said this now i i read this first in in the hamilton's curse that's the name of the book by the way hamilton's curse is the response to hamilton's blessing if you want to get two viewpoints on hamilton read hamilton's blessing and hamilton's curse and you have two authors presenting hamilton from a different perspective i've read them both plus a long list of others one of them is hamilton's works volume 2 page 430 i read the entire speech because here you see it's just a little bit of paraphrase and then a short quotation i wanted to see is this really what he said it is this is really what he said the united states congress would never contemplate marching the troops of one state into the bosom of another for any reason where did he get that idea is that in the constitution earlier in 1774 thomas jefferson wrote a summary view of the rights of british america now this was an interesting read he wrote his majesty has no right to land a single armed man on our shores at any time without the consent of each legislature every state must judge for itself the number of armed men which they may safely trust among them isn't that interesting see that's very much what alexander hamilton was teaching at the new york ratifying convention no right to land a single armed man on our shores without the consent of each state legislature. This doctrine was written into the Constitution. It's Article 4, Section 4. The United States government shall protect every state against invasion. Now think of that one right now with regard to Arizona. And on application of the legislature against domestic violence. What does that say? That says that they can't go into the state with an army until the legislature invites them. Try and tell that to President George Bush or President whoever in the modern times. This doctrine's all long since cast aside as they ran roughshod over state sovereignty. This provided a check and balance on the vested powers found in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15 which provides for calling, the Congress shall have power to provide for calling forth the militia. Does that mean they can send the militia in to trap, speed up, and coerce a state? Not without an invitation. That's the protection of our Constitution's checks and balances. New York delegates, Federalist 19, Anti-Federalist 46, the final vote to determine if the state of New York would ratify the proposed Constitution 30 to 27. This is how close it was. The anti-federalists, a number of them were convinced, and they had accepted and put the proposed plan, and they ratified. Now, George Bush, in 2007, and I'm quoting here from the John Warner National Defense Authorization Act, declared, the president may employ the armed forces to restore public order in any state of the United States the president determines. Was there a constitutional amendment to provide that power to the president? What's the answer? No. No, he has no authority constitutionally. It's a violation of the Constitution. Congress violated and gave him the power unconstitutionally. Remember, the Constitution is to be understood as explained by the ratifiers of the several states. This man became known as the intellectual leader of the Jeffersonian Republicans or the father of states' rights doctrine. In this book, this is another law book on the Constitution, it elucidates the original intent of the founding fathers from a states' rights perspective. Now we're going to take our break now. We're going to rest for a few minutes. Seven is the lucky number. We're going to rest for seven minutes, and then we'll conclude this lesson. And we're going to have you stand on your feet, and some of you wear a vest. We're going to vest you with power. So take a break. Thank you. Thank you. still boring. When I got to college, it was still boring. 
Somewhere after that, about 35 years ago, Joel Ferguson, where are you, Joe? Everybody raise your hand. <laughs> this gentleman right here invited me to come to a home in, not a home, it was an old garage in Lehigh. And that changed my life. It was a pivotal point for Stephen Pratt to hear someone explain American history that actually loved America and had a deep love for liberty. And it was, it was an exciting moment. And so all these years have passed by. I'm twice as old now. And I have a deep love for America and a great love for liberty. And I have only one desire, and that's to pass that on to whoever will listen. So if only one person came tonight, some, some single individual, we'd sit out in the parking lot and we'd talk liberty as long as they were willing to listen. <laughs> okay, let's strike it up here. We get the, the presenter and we push the, turn the lights down on the screen and we will see if we can follow the theme. Oh, I like this one. We able to turn the lights down on the house? Yes. Can you see what they're doing here? This is a wood engraving from the time period when the Federalist and Anti-Federalist were having such contention with each other. Down at the bottom, this, the caption reads, Congress, that's Congress in the picture. Congress, conflict between the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist. And we see here, what are they doing? Oh my goodness, what's this guy got? This looks like the fireplace tongs. And this fellow's got some kind of a club, and he's kicking him down here, and they're shouting at each other, and this guy's waving his fist, and this guy's smoking his pipe with a big silly grin on his face. Just watching what's taking place. Same with this guy here, just a big silly grin, watching these guys contend with one another. There was a conflict in the very beginning. Two contending forces. It was in the Senate of the United States on the 16th of February in 1833, that these two theories of the Constitution stood face to face. Daniel Webster face to face with John C. Calhoun. Albert Taylor Bledsoe continues, for the first time in the history of the country, it was solemnly asserted and argued that the Constitution of the United States was not a compact between the states. Now, last Saturday night, last Friday night, we learned that the Constitution was a compact between the states. It was a contract, and because it was a contract between states, Noah Webster explained they called it a compact. And because the compact constituted, it constituted our plan of government, we called it the Constitution. This is all what we learned last Friday night. Well, there in 1833, these two men stood face to face, and one of them declared, it was not a compact between the states. The Constitution was ordained and established by the whole people of the United States in their aggregate capacity as a nation. And the other person claimed, the people of the several states composing these United States are united as parties to a constitutional compact to which the people of each state is seated as a separate sovereign community each binding itself by its own particular ratification to contending forces. Remember, the consolidating, by the way, they called themselves the consolidating school. Nathan Dane, Daniel Webster, Joseph Story, and numerous other prominent men gathered, and it was in Massachusetts, they gathered together and they discussed in a think tank the great concepts of consolidated government. And they were called the Consolidation School, or Consolidationist, also called the Massachusetts School. Their summary of belief was, sovereignty is the sum of all rights and powers. In the Constitution, sovereignty is delegated to the central government, which is an irrevocable seeding of power. Is delegated the same as seeding? Is there any seated power in any of our founding documents? No. no, not one speck. And yet these two contending forces stood face to face in 1833, and we were told that the power had been seated to the federal government. The consolidating school believed states have sovereignty, except so far as they have seated it. 
Article One, Section One of our Constitution. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States. What kind of powers did we grant to Congress? Vested powers. Are vested powers seated powers? No, not in any way whatever. Article 2, the executive power shall be vested. Article 3, the judicial power shall be vested. vested. Thank you. These are the kinds of powers that we enumerated and gave to the federal government on a temporary basis. Vested powers can be retracted. Pause here for a moment and deal with the words vested, delegated, and seated. Okay, this will be helpful to you. Will the audience please stand? I'm going to have to come down there. I can't do this from up here. Suppose that you were all unemployed and you were standing in front of the Ace Hardware store. And you're wanting to get a job very, very bad. Oh my, I'm the manager and owner. I'm not the manager, I'm the owner of the store. And I'm coming down now to look at this crowd of people. And I'm thinking, there must be someone here I don't want to stay and manage. I want to go on vacation. I want to have a manager. I found a manager already, right here. Jeremy, would you be my manager of my store? I vest you with power to make the decisions necessary to hire and fire at your discretion. I'm going on vacation. Here is the manual of guidelines. Okay? Now, would you please come out into this audience? These people all need a job. We want you to pick the best ones. I think Lowell Nelson looks like a good candidate for the cashier. <laughs> But that's just a suggestion. <laughs> He's right out in the middle of the crowd there. Take these vests and find a, a cashier and someone to run the forklift and someone to run the paint department. I'll carry the box. Okay, do it fast. Find them fast. <laughs> no volunteers. Okay, that's okay. It's okay. No, it's okay. She was really anxious for the job. You only get minimum wage. <laughs> Okay, you're going to, what's, what's, your, what's your job? You are secretary. Secretary, okay. Please come out and stand in the, in the kind of middle front. Forklift operator. Forklift operator? Oh man, look at him there. All sorts of potential. There's a forklift operator. Okay. Okay, please come out with your, your red. You need to get a paint booth operator. And Lowell Nelson's got to be the cashier. It's okay if you hire another cashier. I, I, I've got to go on vacation let this guy do his job. <laughs> Thank you, Lil. Okay, please come up to the front as official aid. In fact, do it. Walk around on that stage. We're all going to get up there anyway. So, well, that's probably enough. Oh, <laughs> cash or coins. Gold or silver. Boy, we got the right guy for the cash register. <laughs> You know, I got a dear friend that runs an Ace Hardware store, and I explained my need, and he gave me these vests to use, and this has been very helpful. So these people have been vested with power. Did they receive any seated power? Did we gift you the cash register? Temporary. It's only temporary. Does that mean you can take the cash register at home at night and take the cash to yourself? No. Are you the, what's your... You're the secretary. Okay, you have a responsibility. You have guidelines, enumerated powers. We carry them, but well, we should have them all pledged. <clears throat> we could do that, couldn't we? You get the idea. And so you agree to the job description. Who's the forklift operator? Uh oh. You're the paint department. Paint's important. Uh, you would love to drive the forklift. Do you have any authority to drive the forklift? Oh, she says if we give her the authority, she would have the authority. Did we give you any authority to drive the forklift? Not yet. Do you think you could qualify for forklift operator? Sure she could. But this is the forklift operator. What's your job? You're the manager. Now, I'm going on vacation, and I'm going to let you all run the store. This is vested power, and that's all it is. Any time I want, I can come back and retrieve the vest. 
You're all fired. <laughs> Thank you for your help. You did good. <laughs> Learning history should be fun. It should be enjoyable. There's one book out on the table by Peter Schiff. He does a really good job in it. Tomorrow we're going to be talking about economics. And Peter Schiff is an economist. And his newest book uses fish for money. And you'll see how the fish reserve notes teach us about our money history. Okay, that's the lesson then on the vested powers. They are not permanent or seated in no way. Now the vested powers, let's see here. Now this leads, when we talk about sovereignty, we get all sorts of phrases, the uses of the term sovereignty, and I've seen all these in current times, and yet these were taken from an 1878 book. That's where these descriptions come from. In Bernard Janet Sage's book, The Republic of Republics, he describes the problem with the word sovereignty. He uses this phrase. He says, this leads to the solacistic absurdity. Now, I'm a blacksmith, and I don't use words like solacistic. But I looked it up in the dictionary. And you know what it said? Solacistic means absurd. <laughs> this leads to the absurd absurdity. <laughs> dual sovereignty. I mean, like every day we see dual sovereignty used somewhere. Divided sovereignty, delegated sovereignty, qualified sovereignty, limited sovereignty, representative sovereignty, federal sovereignty, surrendering essential parts of sovereignty. State sovereignty was largely negated. Have you not seen uses of the term sovereignty in places like this? These are all incorrect uses of the word. They're a lack of understanding for those who have put them into print or spoken them. This is one of my favorite quotes for tonight's lesson. John Taylor of Caroline Page 79, the consolidating school contends that we have two sovereignties, but that one is sovereign over the other. Mr. Hamilton, that we have coordinate sovereignties, but that one is made superlative. Have you ever heard, oh, we're both equal, I'm just more equal than you are? <laughs> this is the nonsense they were teaching in the days of Alexander Hamilton. And John Taylor of Caroline wrote it into his book. Can a state delegate some of its sovereignty to the federal government? Does a state delegate sovereignty? No. no. What do we delegate? Powers. We delegate powers to the federal government. A few specific enumerated powers were delegated to the federal government. In fact, there are 20 of them, and most of them are covered in Article 1, Section 8. We delegate powers. We don't delegate sovereignty. Can sovereignty be divided? No, you can't divide the superlative and still have the superlative. If, if, I, if I am the, if, if the United States is sovereign, excuse me, let's say if the state is sovereign and it gives away half of its sovereignty, it's no longer sovereign. It cannot be superlative if it gives away its sovereignty. Noel Webster and Daniel Webster are two different people. One night somebody comes up and says, oh, I didn't know that Noah Webster did all those nasty things. Well, it wasn't Noah Webster, it was Daniel Webster who was doing the nasty things. Noah Webster defined sovereignty in these terms, supreme in power, the possession of the highest power. Daniel Webster defines it as the sum of all rights and powers. Don't confuse the powers with sovereignty. The Consolidating School believed in the Constitution, sovereignty is delegated to the central government, which is an irrevocable seating of power. This is false propaganda. States have sovereignty except so far as they have ceded it. It's more false propaganda. What did the word sovereignty mean to the ratifiers? The constitutional researcher should seek the understanding of the ratifiers. <coughs> rather than the drafters, for it was the ratifiers who transformed the Constitution from a proposal into basic law. The ratifiers believed 
The federal government is an agent of the sovereign states and possesses only specific delegated responsibilities. Each state, in ratifying the Constitution, is considered as a sovereign body, independent of all others, and only to be bound by its own voluntary act. In this relation, then, the new Constitution will, if established, be a federal and not a national Constitution. We created a federal government, not a national government. And last week on Saturday, we went through a lesson called Original Intent, and we found there were three key words to understanding the Constitution. And the first and most important is federal. What does that mean? We created a federal government and not a national government. Sovereignty is indivisible. Think of the word sovereignty like the word pregnancy. Either a woman is pregnant or she is not pregnant. There is no such thing as divided pregnancy. Likewise, there is no such thing as divided sovereignty. Two sovereignties cannot coexist within the same limits, Hamilton said at the federal convention. Well, he's telling the truth. You cannot have two superlatives and have them both be superlative over the same thing. It's impossible. Two sovereignties cannot exist within the same limits. We must establish a complete sovereignty in the general government. This general power, if it preserves itself, must swallow up the state powers. Oh, my. You see, it didn't start 50 years ago or 70 years ago or in the days of uh, Woodrow Wilson or Fred, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. It didn't start then. It started in the days of Alexander Hamilton. The general power must swallow up the state powers. And so it did. At the National Union Convention in Philadelphia, now the National Union Party was the party that took over. Abraham Lincoln won the first election as a Republican, and the second election he won as a member of the National Union Party. So when he was assassinated and Andrew Johnson took over the, the presidency, he was a member of the National Union Party. They held a National Union Party convention, that's a political party convention, in Philadelphia, August the 14th, 1866. When I read the first statement, an excerpt from a book about that convention, I said, could that be true? Did it really happen? And so we went to the trouble to find the entire messages about the Union Convention. I read them all. I know that I've got them in context. Here's what this man says about that convention. Now, this is the President of the United States. It's something like if we had uh, President Barack Obama speaking to the uh, Democratic Party today. It would be that same kind of a situation. I consider the proceedings of this convention equal to, if not more important, than those of any convention that ever assembled in the United States. Any convention? That's a pretty important convention. And by the way, the author then puts in what the audience does. I like that part. Great applause. <laughs> the National Union Convention of 1866. Then the keynote speaker stands up and he gives a speech. I have read the entire speech. This is a portion of it. The insurrection against the supreme authority of the nation has been suppressed. Now, what's he referring to? He's referring to the South trying to defend their rights and protect themselves against the Northern aggressors. He calls this the insurrection against the supreme authority of the nation. What were we, a federal or a national government? We were a federal prior to this event in history. Okay, picking up on these key words, the insurrection against the supreme authority of the nation has been suppressed. The victory achieved by the national government has been final and decisive. It has established beyond all further controversy and by the highest of all human sanction, the absolute supremacy of the national government. It didn't start 50 years ago, or 70, or 110. In this year of 1866, it was determined who was sovereign. Was it the states, or was it the national? It was the national. That's what they determined. 
Is there any question which of the two contending forces was in control by 1866? No question in my mind. When did federal public servants begin setting precedent for subverting the Constitution? Uh oh, this is really a touching part of the lesson now. If, if you're sensitive to the truth hurts, what's the big word we use for that? Cognitive dissonance. If you're sensitive to cognitive dissonance, this might hurt, okay? When did federal public servants begin setting precedents for subverting the Constitution? Oh, dear. <laughs> Who is this? Oh, that's George Washington. And people don't want to open their minds and understand all people are human. We all make mistakes. Even if he's the great man that he is, he is a great man. He was one of our wonderful leaders. He still made some bad choices and we're suffering from those choices today. George Washington chose a Secretary of State and a Secretary of the Treasury. Uh-oh. Did you get the previous discussion on Hamiltonian and Jeffersonian thinking? And now these two men, are, they're in the same room together and they're supposed to be discussing the future of the country and how to follow the Constitution. Well, George Washington asked their opinion about the National Bank. He wanted them both to make a written statement because Alexander Hamilton said the best thing we could do is establish a national bank and have a national debt. And so he got a written statement from both men and he rejected Thomas Jefferson's and he accept, accepted Alexander Hamilton's. That the National Bank was approved under the implied powers of the Constitution. And this invention of implied power started way back then. Thomas Jefferson, by the way, resigned. Here's another example of, a, of, of an early person who violated constitutional principles by poor choices in the men who would leave the high court. This is John Adams, second president of the United States. Not long before he was supposed to complete his term because Thomas Jefferson had won the next election, he did what was called the point midnight judges. Now, he was appointing judges that would carry on the political tradition of the consolidationist. One of those judges was, who's that? A midnight judge. I don't know if you can tell from there. That's John Marshall. John Marshall, the judge that was the judicial exponent of Alexander Hamilton. Federalist President John Adams in 1798 signed into law the Alien and Sedition Acts which included these four points. The Sedition Act is the one we want to mention right here. We're going to quote a bit from the Sedition Act that became law. It shall be a criminal offense to oppose any federal law or publish any false, scandalous, and malicious writing against the government of the United States, or either House of Congress, or the President of the United States, with an intent to defame or bring them or either of them into contempt or disrepute. Well, what's this all about? We have modern law that's just as bad. This says that the person who is in office, the incumbent, if, if you disagree with them, you can't say anything about it because if you do, you're violating the sedition law. The big question, was there a lawful way in which the people might express their opposition to this federalist legislation? Well, some of the people got together, thought about it, discussed it, and John Taylor of Caroline wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson, who was the vice president at the time. And in the letter he says, the right of the state government to expound the Constitution might possibly be made the basis of a movement, and that movement would be to try and nullify unconstitutional choices made by the federal government. The people in conventions of states are incontrovertibly the contracting parties. The Constitution was a contract written by the states, and this contract created the federal government. This came to be known as the compact theory of the Constitution. Constitutional rebuttal to the Alien and Sedition Acts are known as the Resolutions of 98. In Virginia, the Virginia State Legislature was led by James Madison to create an opposite viewpoint to that which had been passed. And in Kentucky, it was led by Thomas Jefferson. Jointly, these are called the Resolutions of 98. They're good reading. 
I think we'll have a, oh, here's a little short statement from one of them. The first principle of the Constitution, the Federal Union rests upon a compact between free, sovereign, independent states. Now that's quite different than the other viewpoint. The federal government is not federal, it's national. The national government rests upon the aggregate whole of the whole people of America. That's the other viewpoint. It was the aggregate people of, in, 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 using their sovereignty that created. This is the viewpoint on which this body of thinkers relied. The federal union rests upon a compact between free, sovereign, independent states. Whensoever the general government assumes undelegated powers, its acts are unauthoritative, void, and of no force. How about the Obama health care bill? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why 18 state led state attorney generals have indicated they're going to tell the federal government that they just can't do that. They can't pass a violation of the, of the Constitution like that. It's, it's quite a thing across the country, the opposition to the health care bill. And this is the reason why. The Embargo Act of 1807 is instructing the Massachusetts Supreme Court of 1807. Now put this in time frame. I don't have enough time to explain all the evidence and show you every detail. All I can do is give you a little hint about where we were and where we went how perhaps we can get back to the original again. This is a significant quotation. We spurn the idea that the free, sovereign, and independent state of Massachusetts is reduced to a mere municipal corporation. We spurn that idea in 1807 without power to protect its people and to defend them from oppression from whatever quarter it comes. Whenever the national compact is violated and the citizens of the state, this state, are oppressed, by cruel and unauthorized laws. This legislature is bound to interpose its power and wrest from the oppressor its victim. Now, the new, the new days right now, the state sovereignty movement starting to use words like interpose. The Massachusetts state legislature is going to interpose because they are a free, sovereign, and independent state in the year 1807. And they can see their state rights are being violated by the Embargo Act. James Madison in 1821 wrote, our government system is established by compact, not between the government of the United States and the state governments, but between the states as sovereign communities. The evidence is overwhelming in support of this belief. Well, back to where we began, news flash, March the 30th, 2009. Taking on the feds, <coughs> all of us have taken an oath to uphold the Constitution. And the Constitution either means what it says or it means nothing. This is called the state sovereignty movement or the Tenth Amendment movement. The Utah state asserts sovereignty. We won't read the summary, but you remember we had 12 <coughs> bills and resolutions during the past legislative session where we asserted sovereignty. Get to know your state legislature. Find out how they stand, what position they're taking, what they're doing to restore state sovereignty. Virginia and Idaho both passed a Freedom of Choice and Health Care Act, once again to assert sovereignty over this totally unconstitutional health care plan. This is in the year 2010. It passed. March the 23rd, 2010, Attorney generals from 18 states sued the federal government, accusing it of committing an unprecedented encroachment on the liberty of individuals living in the plaintiff's respective states. A picture of a few attorney generals that did that. Montana Legislative Report, May the 19th, 2010, State Senator Aubin Curtis. Must, must we wait to be fined? Or is state's sovereignty a reality? Nothing which has gone on before can measure the outrage perpetrated by the majority in Washington, which has foisted upon Montanans the so-called health care bill, which fines citizens for not buying something they cannot afford in the first place. I was in Montana about three weeks ago, and they said, Auburn, 
this woman, I thought, that's just, I've never seen that name. It's just an unusual name, Robin Curtis. Anyway, she stood up boldly and proclaimed Montana State sovereignty. Now, I got Daniel Webster laying down here with a block of granite on him, best I could do for visual aid here. He's getting close to old age, and he's, he knows he's going to pass on soon. And here is a summary. I put in the bubble the summary of what he was thinking at that time, you know, reading his, his story and what his beliefs are. He wanted to be the President of the United States. He never accomplished that, so time is too short. He knows he won't make it. So, gone is the dazzling prize of the presidency. Before me lies the darkness of the grave. And still the greater darkness that threatens my native land with ruin. This is in the late 1850s, and he can see that things are really tense. Something terrible is about to happen. He rises up just before he passes on. He tells, he tells the truth. <laughs> The truth is this. This is, this is interesting reading it because 1833, he was saying just the opposite. So here he is in the 1850s, and he's trying to explain the truth. Remember the compact of the Constitution. It was deliberately entered into by the states. Remember in 1833, although the Constitution is not a contract, all the states ceded their power to the federal government. Well, here he's trying to repent. And, you know, he didn't make it. Well, I, I tried to think of an epitaph for it. I was going to summarize Daniel Webster. This, you know, as I'm studying, I'm a student of history, and I thought, I'm going to write his epitaph. What would I say on his epitaph? So I wrote this. Here lies Daniel Webster, 1782 to 1852. Great expounder or great deceiver? Those are phrases coming from the Republic of Republics. Some believed he was a great expounder. And others believed he was a great deceiver. I got that far in an audience one night, and somebody said, I've got a better epitaph than that. Now, what's that? It ought to say, too little, too late. <laughs> Albert Taylor Bledsoe in 1907. The great war of coercion shifted the federal government from the basis of compact to that of conquest. What we then lost, we never got back. This is a picture of the United States today from my front room window. Uh, it was a terrible situation, and that's where we are today. We are in an awful situation. We have vast military armaments. In more than 130 countries around the world, we have hundreds of thousands of troops we have something like, I think the number 78,000 left over in Japan, and they surrendered 60 years ago. We have 28,000 in Korea, and they surrendered 50 years ago, and so on around the world. What in the world are we doing? Promotion of sexual impurity. We have cases like the 1973 case of Roe versus Wade and on down the list of corruption. We have the 2003 case of Lawrence versus Texas, where the Supreme Court overruled the state of Texas and would not allow Texas to permit sodomy in the state. Uh, excuse me, to inhibit sodomy in the state. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. Texas passed a law that says sodomy is illegal in the state of Texas. And the Supreme Court says, well, you can't do that. You're violating the rights of the sodomist, and so forth. Misuse of money. Oh, we don't need any explanation on that one. I have never in my lifetime conceived that we could be so careless and thoughtless with the use of money. Tomorrow morning we'll have a lesson called, What Has the Government Done to Our Money? Quite an interesting one, actually. My eight-year-old grandson really liked it. He was the one that listened to the lecture. Eight-year-old sat on the front row, and the next day he says, Grandpa, when are you going to have another one of those eight-year-old lectures? <laughs> Ignore the Constitution. The Constitution means nothing in Washington, D.C. Absolutely nothing. Though they claim it does, but they don't act that way. What should we do? This is the big question, and I'm asked that frequently. People come up and almost with despair in their voice, they will say, what should I do? I don't know what you should do. I know what I should do. God wants.
wants me to proclaim liberty throughout the land to all the inhabitants thereof. And I have chosen to try and do that by working with good people all around, wherever they may be, looking for an opportunity to explain the story of America. What is the purpose of the Know Your Liberty series? I was asked that today. I was supposed to sum that up in front of this little glass box and tell that piece of glass how America should proceed from where we are. What should we do? I believe the most fundamental principle that we should do is presented by this man right here. What he said was profound. It is the solution to our problem. And it will not be solved in Washington, D.C. It will not be solved by a better president or a better senator. Oh, we may help it some by having a different person chosen than the incumbent, but it will be solved by you and I following this advice. Preach a crusade against ignorance. If a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it expects what never was and what never will be. Thomas Jefferson. What's next? Well, tomorrow morning, the 17th, at 10 a.m., in the Eagle Mountain City Hall, we'll present Embracing Global Governance. We're going to start on a beautiful, huge ship in the bay on, off the coast of Canada. That's where the lust begins in 1941. And we will move there from there up through to the present day. That's our art opening lesson tomorrow morning. Embracing Global Governance. We're going to talk about treaty-making powers and how they have been abused and other principles of our country. This takes us back to the closing slide I used a week ago. I think it's a, a very beautiful painting, a lovely, lovely exhibit by John McNaughton. The people behind the Savior are the ones of the past generations. They're gone. The people down in the right-hand corner seem to be those that have made bad choices. Not bad people, but people that made bad choices. And those choices have affected their, themselves and those around them. The people on the right seem to be you and I. They look just like this audience right here. With the youth standing there pointing to the Constitution being held up by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yes, the perfect law of liberty. In the book of James, the word is spoken of, the word of God. It's referred to as the perfect law of liberty. And that certainly includes political liberty in the land of the free. As Jesus spoke to his apostles, and in the closed chambers, he turned to Peter and said, Simon, Simon, Satan desireth thee to sift thee as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. What should you do? When thou art converted, strengthen your neighbors, strengthen thy brother. I am converted, and many of you are also, to the great cause of liberty. I am converted to the American Republic as defined in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States according to their original intent. When thou art converted, share it with others. Strengthen thy brother. Now you've done good because the audience tonight is at least 50% bigger than last Saturday night. And we challenged you last Saturday night to bring a guest. So if some of you took that seriously and have brought people with you tonight. When they are converted, there is something you can do, but you must decide that yourself. You can't ask another person to tell you how to conduct your life in that regard. Will the audience please stand? We close our meetings. It's, it's, I'm going to back up just slightly. Uh, uh, just a couple of years ago, it hasn't been very long. The old scholar that first taught me in the old garage over here in Lehigh, Utah, he was in his 90s. And I was, I was going to give a speech to some international, not, not international, but national convention. A big convention in Salt Lake City with people from all over the country. It was a political speech to a political party. And I thought, I wonder what my topic got to be. And I went to the old man, just dropped him off the street. He was my dear, dear friend, W. Cleo Scouse. 
And I explained briefly that I was about to give a speech to a big convention. What topic should I present? Now, all those years, seven years, I traveled and lectured full time for him, research and lecturing. I, I thought maybe he would pick some point of the Constitution that he'd like to present or some story from American history. He didn't even hesitate. It's a, it's, it was as if he had thought about that question. However, he didn't know I was coming, but he answered without hesitation. What message should I present to the American people? Testify of Jesus Christ. And so every lesson now, we bring in God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and testify and witness that we must return to his teachings, even the perfect law of liberty, if we are going to save this nation from an awful destruction. And that is my witness to you. One way of testifying is singing together. This is an old hymn. It's one we should be familiar with. There are two verses, however. The second verse is quite meaningful to me. I would invite you to join singing both verses, and then I'm going to try and do a short recitation that I call a conversational prayer, which further witnesses of Christ. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Shout to recite some lines from several important spots and things I've learned around the country. Sometimes I can't remember the lines. I hope that God will help me to remember them because they're beautiful. And the message is, is profound. It was many years ago, and I think it was in the state of South Dakota. I've been there several times. When I had completed a conference on our American heritage and the Constitution, and the chairman took me to the airport. He was not a member of my faith. But as we stood there in this jostling crowd at the International Airport, if there is such a thing in South Dakota, <laughs> it was far away from the centers of population. As I remember it, we were out in the, in the boondoggles, as the word goes. But in any event, there was a group of people that were interested in American liberty. And just before we parted, he said to me, we will probably never meet again. I would like to say a conversational prayer before we part. And without bowing his head, because that would be an act of piety he didn't want to show, he simply wanted to talk to God for a few minutes with me. And it was a choice moment I have never forgotten. As this man poured his heart out to our Heavenly Father, I feel humble and incapable of meeting the same level of spirituality that he was on. But I will try to share a few thoughts from these good people I have gleaned as we've traveled about the country. Dear God, we the people here in the Westlake High School in Saratoga Springs, Utah, gratefully acknowledge the blessings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as creator and ruler of the universe and of these United States. We hereby appeal to him for mercy, aid, comfort, guidance, and the protection of his providence as we work to restore and preserve these United States. Our great country was founded not by religionists, but by Christians, 
not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, peoples of other faiths have been and are afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom of worship here. This is a choice land, and whatsoever nation shall possess it shall be free from bondage and from captivity and from all other nations under heaven, if they will but serve the God of the land, who is Jesus Christ. America needs men and women of great moral courage who have prepared themselves with working knowledge of the principles and practices of freedom as defined in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States according to its original intent. We do not have the luxury of retiring to our own private cloisters to pursue only our own private special interest. Strong voices are needed. The voices of those that have prepared themselves with a working knowledge of our organic documents of freedom. The weight of the stance we take may be sufficient to tip the scales in favor of truth and right. We thank you, our Father in heaven, for freedom of assembly. We thank you for this beautiful high school in which we're allowed to make this presentation. We thank you for the loved ones and family we have. We thank you for those brothers and sisters throughout the world that yearn for freedom, that live in countries where freedom is oppressed. We thank you for this great country of America. We thank you for the founding fathers, those wonderful people who devoted great portions of time and fortune and sometimes their lives to establish a land of liberty. We realize the great destiny of this land is to provide a place from which the gospel of Jesus Christ can go forth to the whole world and fulfillment of the promises given to our great, great grandfather Abraham that his seed would be a blessing to the entire earth. May we take part in that by identifying specifically our own personal responsibility and carrying it out with diligence. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.